Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another round of Thread Talks. I'm Whitney Young, HGA's program coordinator. In this hour, we will feature another three wonderful topics, 15 minutes in length. Uh, before we jump into today's hour, uh, we're going to let people join as they get on. So I want to preview what we have left ahead today on this wonderful Saturday. We have three more events for you to join today. At 3 p.m. Eastern, we have a Marketplace Live featuring the Fiber Studio, followed by a 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern studio tour fe featuring the famous Patsy Z, who is a wonderful hand spinner. And then we end the night at 5.30 p.m. Eastern with a Marketplace Live featuring Lunatic Fringe Yarns. But the focus now is on this round of Thread Talks. And we, our first persistent person up is Phyllis Alvik, and she is going to be presenting on looms for complex weaving. Take it away, Phyllis. Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining my talk. I'm going to talk about looms for complex weaving. Um, in 1979, I bought a 16 harness loom. Uh, during that summer of 79, while I was still waiting for my loom to be delivered, I went to the uh, Midwest uh, Weavers Guild and happened to be sitting at a table at lunch where Marianne Hoskinson was sitting. I mentioned to the friend that I was talking to when she asked me what was new in my life, I said, I, I'm getting a 16 harness loom. Marion handed me this piece of paper that detailed how she was starting a group of 16 harness weavers. Well, so I, I joined the 16s from the very first. Uh, uh, and in those days, just doing something on a 16 harness loom was considered sensational. It involved a lot of gymnastics, a lot of different feet and intricate tie-ups, and there was always a problem of not quite enough feet for what one wanted to do. So that just producing any kind of sample was considered pretty remarkable. Uh, as we got into it, uh, and things, then the quality of the sample became more important. Well, um, like many weavers, I have several looms, and uh, this 16 harness loom is now dedicated to doing these little patterns. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen now is uh, my latest creation. It's a, a pocket for a phone. Uh, as you might have noticed, women's clothes don't have functional pockets, if they have pockets at all. They're not pockets you can put things in. So this is a pocket I can tie around my waist. Um, with this loom, I've dedicated it to doing uh, block weaves. And I figure out these block weaves by filling in squares on graph paper. And I set up this particular warp so it's symmetrical and I can do all of these designs on this particular setup. But the problem is I really don't like uh, climbing underneath the loom to retie it up. And even though I do multiple feet and can even step on one pedal, sneak my toe under another and get a, catch another one, I still don't have enough feet. So um, I invented uh, this that goes on top of the loom and essentially converts the loom into also a hand-powered loom. So I just pull one of the um, cords that lifts the harness and then I don't need as many, I, as many feet where I'll use some feet and some hands to produce this. Uh, and uh, the, the way we set this up is um, uh, holes were, were drilled in the, the 
top bin of the uh, of the loom, and the threads come uh, the straight up from the harnesses, so they pull straight, and then um, our uh, uh, feed into this mechanism at the top of the loom, so I can easily grab up and get them when I need them. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, a computer-assisted loom entered my life, and this meant that I could do things that were really impossible on the other loom even with the feet and even with my adaptive uh, one, because things could be programmed uh, into uh, a, a setting. And um, uh, with, with this loom on the side is the, the, the uh, Davi mechanism. And um, there are solenoids uh, that activate the different harnesses, and there's a computer that sits up on top that tells me where I am in my pattern. Uh, this is activated underneath by two treadles. Uh, one, uh, the, the one on the right lifts all of the harnesses, and the one on the left just advances the sequence to the next uh, 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 pick in my weaving. Well, I decided recently that um, probably due to being shut in and realized that this was going to be a long haul, that I wanted to upgrade the loom. You'll notice that the old loom and this new loom look amazingly alike. What is different is the uh, computer, the interface, the uh, CompuDobby. This is an AVL loom. It's the studio loom. And uh, there are 24 harnesses. I am using just 16 for this particular weave. Uh, what is also new on this one is you'll notice I no longer have the pedals underneath. Uh, oh, this is the Dobby mechanism on the side. And yeah, that's kind of looking down into it. And those are the solenoids that get activated uh, by my uh, computer program. On this loom, I also have this device underneath, which is an absolutely wonderful invention called an e-lift. I no longer have to use my muscles to lift the harnesses. Uh, that uh, I just press a button and it goes to the next row in my weaving. Uh, this uh, program is uh, uh, PCW uh, uh, Fiberworks, and it is also the driver for my loom. S so I can design on the program and then take the program to the loom and it will weave. So uh, this is showing the row of weaving that I am on right here. Uh, with this particular um, uh, one, you can see this button is what activates the e-lift. And it also not only brings up the harnesses, but advances to the next harness, so I don't have that extra step in the process. Uh, I am finishing um, with uh, this design on the loom, which is the 16 sample for this year. Uh, the assignment this year was a satin weave, and I'm doing uh, uh, progressive satin, which goes from warp face to weft face satin in uh, a wonderful um, uh, way of dealing it uh, that uh, 
an English uh, weaver by the name of um, uh, uh, Brenda, um, uh, who is in the group, told us how how it works. Uh, so I will cut these off and send these samples um, uh, really to other weavers around the country and even around the world. We have a couple in England and one in New Zealand and maybe a couple still in Canada. Uh, so I know people uh, will probably have questions. So I will put uh, my um, email into the chat box so you can address individual questions to me if you would like. Also in the chat box will be uh, my uh, website where you can see all the 16 samples I've done over the years. Uh, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to be able to talk about something that I love doing. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Um, you are known for your complex weavings and we just adore them. So thank you for your time to share this today. Okay. Next up, we have Molly Elkind and she is gonna be talking about designing the big one. So Molly, I'm gonna throw it over to you now. Okay, I'm here. Bear with me for a second while I get my PowerPoint up. Um, and play from start. I want to just say a big kudos to HGA for putting together all of this great programming this week. And thank you so much for asking me to participate. This has been amazing. Um, so I am a tapestry weaver and like all weaving, tapestry has a long, glorious and intimidating history. Um, I am both awed and inspired by the amazing pieces done in the past. One of my favorite types of tapestry is known as the mille fleur, which is French for a thousand flowers. The most famous examples are the unicorn tapestries done in the Middle Ages in which a dark background is enlivened with literally hundreds of accurately depicted plants, flowers, and animals. Modern have also done mille fleur tapestries. Uh, one of my favorite is the French monk, Dom Robert, who designed in the mid 20th century. And he updated the idea with incredibly colorful, witty and joyful tapestries like you see in the bottom right there. Other contemporary tapestry artists are also inspired by the Mille Fleur theme. Uh, Betty Hilton Nash wove this piece as an explicit response and homage to the tapestries of Dom Robert. Um, it's also the third piece in a series that she did about butterflies and the threats that they are facing. Uh, here's another piece in that series. It's called Save the Monarch Plant Milkweed. And so what Betty's done carefully or cleverly is to kind of flip the emphasis from the flowers and plants in the meal fleur to the animals and then the plant background or ecosystem. Kathy Sporing is another artist who's recently done a, a version of Emile Fleur. In her version, she's uh, rendered the theme in the bold strokes of graffiti. Since I moved to New Mexico in 2018, I've been thinking I'd like to weave a kind of southwestern Emile Fleur featuring the native grasses, wildflowers, and animals of our area. I've been entranced by the completely new environment here. Um, under our big bright blue skies. And I wanted to put all of that somehow into a big, amazing Mille Fleur tapestry. Here are a few of the photos I've taken to give you a sense. I've actually taken more than 600 photos of I have no shortage, and yet I had no idea how to begin designing this big, fat, many splendored Mille Fleur tapestry. Even after weaving dozens of tapestries and even teaching classes in design, I was stymied. I freaked my own self out. I had too much information. It seemed overwhelming. As you know, if you've been a weaver for very long, weaving can sometimes be very humbling. 
So I decided that before tackling the big piece, I should weave small studies of individual plants. When in doubt, make samples is my motto. So I wove several small pieces about the flowers and grasses individually. This is the uh, one called Indian Paintbrush. This is based on the California poppy, which popped up in our backyard last year. The evening primrose. This is called wet spring because after a lot of colorful grasses uh, appearing in our greenway. And this is another study of grasses. And I was playing around here with eccentric weave and a few other things. This is probably my favorite of all the uh, pieces I did in this series um, because I was experimenting with using Raya knots and that's kudzu yarn actually um, to weave these elements that come out from the surface. Um, and I liked it so much because it was pure weaving. The yarn and the technique did all the work. There was no pictorial representation of grass, only what I think is a weaverly one. And these pieces were fairly successful. I even sold a couple. Um, and I thought, hey, I can just mount these individual pieces as an installation and I can call it a fragmented meal flur. This is what it looks like right now, the ones that are on our wall in our house. I even started working on a rendition of the yucca plant that would go with this grouping. I spent a lot of time sketching, making and revising a collage even weaving samples you can see there on the right. But I kept getting bogged down and stuck and losing interest. And meanwhile, the idea of doing one big piece just wouldn't let me go. So I reached out for a little mentoring to a fellow tapestry weaver in New Mexico, the amazingly talented um, and experienced weaver, Elizabeth Buckley. She is also inspired by the landscape here and she asked me some really good questions the most important of which turned out to be, will there be a horizon line? In other words, am I weaving a landscape with a foreground and a background? Will there be a line between the land and the sky? And that turned out to be pivotal. I also began to realize that this project was becoming so difficult to design because I was on the verge of wanting to weave more and more abstractly more and more experimentally, like in that little grass piece I just showed you, and less pictorially. And so for several months, I've kind of waffled back and forth between the two. And here's some of what I've done. I did lots of sketches and watercolors. These are just a couple. I did some detailed drawings of yucca pods there on the right and other plants. I also used blind contour drawing to draw the outlines of clouds on watercolor backgrounds. Blind contour is when you don't look at the page that you're drawing on. You just keep your eyes on the subject and you trace around the outlines of the clouds in this case with your eyes and not looking at what your pencil is doing on the paper. And for me, I get some really I was starting thinking a lot at this point about the sky as an important element. There are some more watercolor studies and some palettes on the right, palettes of wildflowers with their colors and some quick loose sketches, some of which are very abstract. I did collages of painted papers that I had and I added new marks with paint and other media. Collage is usually my go-to method of designing for tapestry since both tapestry and collage revolve so much around shapes. On the left, you can see an attempt to suggest the whole variety of wildflower shapes and colors along with the grasses. But I wasn't very happy with this at all in the end. It seemed too cluttered to me. Um, I now see there are some ways I could improve it if I decide to go back to it. The piece with the two sections on the bottom right there, coming back, it was so simple and it really seemed to distill for me the whole idea of the meal fleur to what was becoming the two really important aspects for me, which were the grasses and the sky. No flowers at all. Some of the collages I did were not rectangular, or they weren't even flat. 
I was and I am interested in exploring tapestries with 3D elements and non-rectangular shapes. And you can see here, I'm still waffling back and forth a little bit between the total abstraction you see on the right and some suggestion of a pictorial shape, uh, pictorial landscape on the, on the right. Um, I don't know if you can see, see the full collage there on your screen, but there's a little bit of a horizon line in the far right. I turned a couple of these uh, designs, a couple of these sketches and samples into woven samples. Um, the one on the left, I think, is more resolved and better. It's a process of two steps forward, one step back. I made yarn wraps and I wove several samples of skies and grasses. I experimented with a bunch of different compositions, but still nothing was gelling. I wrote lots of post-it notes to myself and stuck them up on my design wall. I find that putting things into words can be very helpful when I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is I'm trying to do. Objects, not pictures was reminding me that I wanted to move away from making recognizable images. Space, air, breath, delight, surprise, joy. These post-it notes reminded me that these were the feelings I was trying to convey. Whenever I'm struggling with a design, I have to remind myself that the key question is, what feeling am I trying to convey? The more clear and specific I can be about that feeling, the better I can make visual choices. What shapes, lines, color, textures, composition, we're gonna get that feeling across. Sometimes I do so much writing as part of my design process that it overtakes the sketch, as you can see here. When the pandemic first started, my husband and I started taking hikes almost every morning on the trails near us. And I began to realize on these walks that it wasn't the exact appearance of the flowers and the grasses that I wanted to convey. Again, it was the feeling of the big sky, the open air, the sometimes really fierce winds that we get here, and the backlit grasses. That was the essence of what I wanted to get across. And it was the feeling that despite everything that's happened in this horrible year, there is still beauty in this world. There's still hope. Nature is still doing nature's thing, despite what's going on with us. Spring and summer and fall came anyway. I decided I could distill all this into those two elements, sky and grass. I made a full scale collage, 27 inches high by 44 inches wide, cutting up the painted papers that I had on hand. This overall patterned piece with lots of white spaces seems to me to convey the feeling of space, air, and breath that I was getting after. I still want to refine the colors and the composition of this design. And of course, I have to figure out how to weave all that white space. Am I gonna break it up with cutbacks or add another layer of shapes or, I'm not sure still, I'm still figuring that out. While all this was going on, I was also on the side exploring a series of small pieces using unwoven open warps, the up and down threads. I want to see how far I can push tapestry weaving without doing lots of tightly packed. Here's another sample where I was playing around with the open warp idea and experimenting with some crazy yarns that I've been collecting. And my friends who have been patiently listening to my ongoing angst about this big piece started to say, when they heard me very excited about the open weave, they said, do it in open weave, do it in open weave. So I decided to weave two samples of the same nine inch square section of that big collage I showed you with all the white space. You can see that section up in the upper left hand corner. On the lower left is one woven sample done in traditional tightly packed tapestry weave. On the other side on the right is a sample of the same, more or less the same design with open warps. I did fiddle bit with the shapes uh, in between the two samples. Right now, different design, but I'm experimenting here with um, a couple things. There's some painted blue splotches on the warp, so that's an option for adding another layer of design. 
And I'm also playing around with some semi-open warp weaving. You can see on the right there that there's, the uh, weft is, is leaving a lot of open space, but it's not completely open. So my testing and my sampling are continuing. I wish I could show you a final design and show you my big loom all warped up and ready to go, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, I do know it's going to be just about the shards of sky and the floating and drifting grasses. No wildflowers, no horizon lines or mountains or clouds or animals. I'm just weaving in thin air. So why am I telling you all this? I want you to know that the design process is process. If you know that already, it's nonlinear. It's not totally under your control. Your materials and random ideas and comments from other people are all going to play a role. The pandemic that we're in right now has made it harder for many of us to find the time and energy to weave. And believe me, I have those days too. But I think it's teaching all of us how to roll with the punches more, how to embrace uncertainty, and if we can, to dive deep into the pursuit of an idea. We might be stuck mostly at home, but we can still take creative risks. We can go anywhere on our looms. So I want to encourage you to try that big idea that's been in the back of your mind, even if it is the big one. Try weaving by breaking the rules. See what happens and then show the rest of us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Molly. Your work just blows me away. And I know, <laughs> like me, I'm sure all the viewers today can't wait to see the finished product. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you again. Our final Thread Talk presenter today is Lynn hawking Mani, and she is coming to us from the UK. And she is going to be presenting on oral textiles, distributed capabilities, learning and outcomes from a practice based research project in Scotland, UK. Thanks very much Whitney, for the introduction. I've, um, I've really enjoyed hearing from, um, from the last two speakers. Sorry, so just give me a second while I share my screen with you. Okay, can you see that? Can you see that PowerPoint? Yes, we see it. Fabi, thanks. So, um, so yeah, I'm joining you here from um, 57 degrees north and the east coast of Scotland in the UK, where it's currently 7.30 p.m. So, dark outside. Um, I thought I'd just start with giving you a bit of an introduction to who I am, and then um, I'll tell you a bit about a research project that I've been uh, involved with in Scotland and developed. Um, and um, how how it's going, what's happening, and what some of the outcomes from it are. Um, really, hopefully, as a way to maybe get you to think a bit differently about your own practice and the way that you work. Um, so I am actually a scientist by training and worked um, as an academic researcher until 2015, at which point myself and my family headed off and spent nine months traveling around the world where I managed to spend an awful lot of time in um, South America, Central America and Southeast Asia, um, visiting textile museums and learning about weaving, which was just wonderful. So I initially learned to weave myself with a backstrap loom in Northern Thailand. Um, and now I have my own weaving studio here in Aberdeen, uh, where I combine my kind of dual loves of science and textiles and create objects um, fabrics and um, kind of more sculptural objects that are inspired by data of some kind. And there are two kind of main focuses for that. One of those is um, DNA sequences and genetics, because that was my research background. Um, and this piece that you can see here on the loom is a, kind of a variation of a summer and winter block weave, where the pattern is specified by, um, by genetic information, by ways the kind of the pattern for this is completely out with my control and that's one of the things I quite enjoy about working with data as a source of design inspiration. Um, as well as genetics I'm kind of interested in ancestry. My um, my mum did a bit of research into her family history and discovered that actually there's at least seven generations of us who've been in some way involved with the weaving trade in northeast Scotland. Um, so I've been thinking about um, 
kind of explorations of how to represent those flows of information between um, seven generations. And this is one of the pieces that I created where I was doing that. So you can see that there's a massively spaced warp there, a variety of wefts that are used and they're kind of traveling through the warp in, in very many different ways. Um, and not intentionally, but this piece came off the loom, ended up looking like a dress. So I kind of felt like all the female ancestors were trying to express themselves and come out of the loom and remind us of all of the work that they had done in the past. Um, so genetics and ancestry is one side of things. The other side in the project that I'm going to talk you through in details today, um, I have, sorry, my son has just come in the door, my dog might bark, apologies. Um, my, um, the, other, the other aspects of interest is in bioacoustics and sound inspired design, and that's the research project that I've been involved with. So um, I got involved with a researcher who worked at the Glasgow School of Art at the time, um, who was interested in heritage and had been looking at knitting patterns and how they are recorded and how they act as a, as a record of landscape. Um, and thinking about back in the 1950s, certainly over in the kind of the west coast of Scotland, many of the textile patterns and particularly the, the knitting patterns and some of the songs that went with them were, were felt to be lost and there was a push to document them. Um, and they became kind of fixed in time in the 1950s in a way that they weren't when they were Kind of in active use. So they used to be very dynamic things, they changed in response to the environment, the, the knitters and weavers themselves switched up the patterns depending on what was happening around about them. Um, whereas we now kind of ended up a point in time where those things have almost become um, kind of memorialised and where people are scared to modify them and kind of scared to mess with the, the provenance of them. Um, so this project was really born out of this idea of how, how can we build on all of that kind of knowledge, the provenance, the desire to take inspiration from landscape and take advantage of the skills and knowledge, but kind of take it, make, make it more current, make it more relevant to contemporary society. So through this, um, George, my collaborator, got interested in recording some of the sounds. So again, the soundscape of the Western Isles of Scotland was fairly started. Um, and this image at the top that you can see is actually the song of a, a lapwing, uh, which is one of the birds that live on the marker. I'll try to play it. Hopefully you, hopefully you managed to hear that. Um, so there's the kind of the sweeping trills of the bird and you can see those represented in that um, image at the top. And spectrogram is a way of looking at changes in pitch and intensity over time. So as you kind of move from left to right, that's the sound changing over time. And as you go from the bottom to the top, that's the, the kind of the, the low noise, up high noises. And the brighter the spot that you can see, so those kind of more yellow white ones are where the, the, that pitch is loudest at that moment in time. So we're thinking that actually here's a way to take something that's kind of what is your kind of non-standard inspiration and in it comes from um, a non-visual sense but clearly when we're working with weaving and knitting um, we need to translate that into some kind of visual language so this spectrogram was a was an interesting starting point for us to explore for that um, second panel down that you can see is one where George has turned it into a, a knitting pattern and I did knit that up um, for him it's just a kind of a straightforward um, kind of replication of the spectrogram where we just kind of cut out some of the, the background noises. But as a weaver, I was kind of interested in getting it onto the loom. So, um, so very kind of quickly shifted myself into thinking about experimenting with the loom setup. So here, I wasn't interested in taking the pattern and recreating the visual pattern in the fabric that I created. What I wanted to do was to recreate that pattern in the threading setup and in the way that I treadled the loom. And actually, again, like I mentioned earlier with the DNA sequence stuff, the pattern that comes out is then um, kind of largely dictated by the sound that we were looking at. And you, clearly you have control over, um, you have control over elements of it, you can control over what color warp and weft that you're working with, um, and you can have control over how you interpret that sound and what weave structure, for example, that you work with. Um, and for those of you in the room, the, the one that I went with was kind of overshot-ish, but but not entirely. It's definitely not the, the kind of the overshot um, enthusiasts among you will know that that's not a true overshot. Um, 
So we had started off with this case study um, and been able to demonstrate that we, we could create fabrics that were kind of visually interesting, had a fun story behind them. But really, we weren't quite sure whether we were just in this really odd little kind of niche part of the world, um, niche part of our own heads, where we were the only ones who might be interested in doing this. And really, it was just a fun little kind of hobby project on the side. So what we wanted to do was then move on and see if we could interest other textile practitioners in getting involved with this project. And also think about what it would mean if we rolled it out to um, the other disciplines. So um, weaving, knitting and screen printing and how other practitioners would work with it in their hands. Because obviously I can take it and work with it in a way that's very specific to my skills and knowledge. But we were interested to see what types of patterns other people could create, what kinds of noises they wanted to work with. Um, and we were also kind of from the outset very keen that this process was one that we would make as accessible as possible for other people. So we were trying to use technology that most of us nowadays have to hand. So we used um, smartphones to record the sounds. We used free apps to record the sounds and to visualize them as well. Um, that kind of visualizing process, we used a program that is free to, for anyone to to work with and is quite straightforward in terms of working with it. So you can um, you can visualize the sound, you can clip it, you can find the pieces that you're most interested in looking at, you can play about with the settings to, to amplify or reduce elements of the, the sound that you're most interested in. And then obviously we wanted them to see what type of textile patterns and objects they might want to turn it into. So we managed to get some funding for this work from the Royal Society of Edinburgh and recruit six textile practitioners from across Scotland. Um, we had two weavers, two knitters, so one a hand knitter and one a machine knitter, and two screen printers involved in the project. And this is the group here. That's me on the right, um, my research collaborator, George, and then kind of carrying on from the side. Side George is Callie Booker, who some of you may know as a previous president of Complex Weavers. And then Beth and then Olive and Orla and not shown in here is Marie, who was the other weaver in the project. Um, we're spread all over Scotland and just um, in case you don't know where Scotland is, I don't know if you can see my, my little arrow moving around here relative to where the US is. Um, that's where we are. Those blue dots just show where we're kind of spread out across the, across the Scottish nation. We have a broad kind of geographic coverage. Um, a broad kind of landscape as well, the, the, the kind of the weather that we get and the, the scenery is quite different from the east coast to the west coast of Scotland and from north to south as well, which also made it interesting in terms of thinking about what people were inspired by. Um, we ran a series of workshops where we brought people together, we explained what the process was and then we asked them to work with it, bringing their own kind of unique skills and expertise to the table in terms of thinking about how they would kind of use this process as a jumping off point, but then they, how they would actually work with it. And we were interested just to really think about what the potential implications on their practice might be, whether they might want to adopt it as part of their, their routine practice, what kind of support they might need in order to, um, to work with this moving forward. And as I said before, what types of noises they would be interested in. And it was quite fascinating, actually, that everyone really gravitated towards the sounds of, of nature rather than any man-made noises, at least in the first iteration of this project. So here's a bit more detail of one of the examples of Callie's work. So she had been out to um, one of our local beaches here and had recorded the sound of waves crashing against the rocks. So that image on the top left of the screen, the kind of pinks and blues, um, is what the spectrogram looked like. You can see that there's massive potential there in terms of how you interact with that um, and how you think about then translating that into any type of weaving pattern. The next, the kind of centre image in the top is where Callie has then looked at it and kind of found a pattern line within the image. And then at the bottom, she's taken that and used a network drafting method to convert that into a, a weaving pattern and produce um, produce this fabric on the right hand side which is just absolutely gorgeous um, and if you ever get the chance to see it and touch it please take the opportunity 
So this here is a kind of a summary of some of the outputs that came from the project. Um, basically, there was huge um, kind of pattern potential within all of this, whether people were working with tapestry weaving, shaft loom weaving, hand knitting, machine knitting, screen printing. Um, all the, each individual came up with hundreds of different ideas of ways that they might be able to work with this and patterns that they could create. Um, and we're quite excited by the possibilities and um, keen to incorporate it into their practice moving forward. We finished up the first phase of this project with a, a public exhibition, which kind of, it was as much about the process as it was the textiles. And that in itself was quite fascinating because it meant through the, you know, people who were interested in sounds and ways of interacting with sounds, but maybe not in textiles, came along to this as much as people who were interested in textile kind of finding out about the landscape element. So because it was a crossover project, it meant that we got a much kind of wider audience coming along to view the final objects that were created. Um, you can see Callie's piece just at the front there behind the first plinth. Um, we've published research papers on this. If anybody's interested in getting a hold of copies of these, then you can drop me an email. Um, I put my email address on the last slide. We've also created a free to download pattern book, which is on the project website called Patterning Sounds. And that one, that image of Callie's, the, the pattern of Callie's is in there if anybody wants to try making it for themselves. It's a eight shaft pattern. Um, again, the whole purpose of this was about trying to make this process, um, kind of send it out into the world and, and give people a chance to interact with it and work with it if they, if they wanted to. I myself have been really fortunate to be able to um, take this process to um, a weaving collective in Oaxaca, Mexico, as part of a residency that I took in February last year. Um, and again, this, this was a, a kind of a, it was as much for me about the kind of impact on the people as it was the, their practice. I ended up with kind of nine um, extended family members working on this. I think I should have had three or four, but they got quite excited about the, the prospect of it. I was there with them for three weeks. They recorded the sounds that they were interested in from their local environment. We turned it into patterns. We wove them up, and we had a we had um, a kind of trip session with some local designers, and uh, a final exhibition um, within Oaxaca City itself. And you can see here for Mina, um, with her piece of weaving on the table behind her, which was she recorded her daughter counting to ten in their native Zapotec language and has translated that into a long table runner. The one behind is another woman who um, recorded the sound of herself in, in Mexico when they make like Oaxaca, when they make chocolate, hot chocolate, it's kind of solid cakes of chocolate, which are kind of simultaneously ground and whisked. So that noise behind Fermina there is that whisking, grinding noise. Um, and just as a kind of a side note, one of the really fascinating things about this project was actually the impact on the women in the collective who felt that their, the sounds that they valued were given equal voice and importance to the sounds of the men in their collective. And crucially, the younger members of the collective became re-engaged in what they had previously considered to be quite a kind of becoming an, an outmoded means of earning a living and suddenly now that they could see this opportunity to bring digital elements into that very traditional weaving and kind of meld together these digital and analog aspects suddenly they were really interested again in the possibilities um, of what they might do with it um, and we've now in Scotland kind of moved the project on a bit and brought in some makers from different non-textile disciplines so we have jewellery makers and ceramicists and furniture makers and each of these uh, makers from different disciplines have been paired up with one of our original six fortunately everyone who took part in the project loved it so much that they wanted to carry on um, and those original textile group have been sharing their knowledge with the new makers and they've been working on collaborative creation so thinking about how how they use this core process of sound inspired design to collaboratively create new objects things that individually that wouldn't be possible for them to make and it's really got them thinking about um kind of where the boundaries of their discipline sits and how they can really push themselves creatively and experiment so 
on that note, hopefully this has given you a bit of a flavour of the project. You can find out a lot more about it at the website. You can get the pattern book. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, my email address is there. Um, if you're inspired to try it yourself, then please do share your results with us. We would absolutely love to see them. Thank you very much. Thank you much, so much, Lynn, for sharing this wonderful project with us and introducing us to the concept of making uh, a pattern from sound. I know I want to try it. Thank well, you. Make sure yeah. you share your results. <laughs> I will do that once I can add it to my list of projects. Thank you again. Uh, next up, we have a 3 p.m. Marketplace Live featuring the Fiber Studio. And at 4 p.m. Eastern is a studio tour with Patsy Zavazhowski. If you can please make sure you sign up for that one early um, so that you get in. Again, we'll see you over at 3 p.m. Eastern at a Marketplace Live. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>